This is my wealth story. As I mentioned, this is part one of my wealth story. And I think it's so important for all of us to, um, to listen to other people's stories about how they started investing, how they built their wealth, because I, we're going to break down a lot of misconceptions that we all started with a bigger pot of money. We all started a lot earlier than, uh, than you think, or we all had some sort of unfair advantage going into this. And I think that we do have unfair advantages, but I think that they're less obvious than we think. So this is my attempt to kind of like pull the curtains back between, you know, of how I got started in real estate investing and just investing in general um, so that hopefully more people can see that like, oh, I'm, I'm right there too, or I'm 10 steps ahead, hopefully, or I can do that even though I'm one step behind. That's my goal for today's presentation. So this is where I, we're going to take it back to, actually, let me go back to full screen here, make sure that all right. So this began back in 2019, or rather like it hit the ground running in 2019 for my investing. I finally, as I'll let you know, found real estate investing. I was like, okay, I'm now ready to invest in real estate. But in my head, this is what was going on. So many different questions about where do I get started? Which strategy do I use? How do I have enough time to do all of this? Which market? You know, it, there's just a lot of overwhelming information when everyone gets started in real estate investing and even investing in general um, that I want you to know that we all feel the same way often. How am I going to do this? How is it going to fit my lifestyle now? And um, how am I going to fit it all in? And for me, it kept coming back to this question. How much time must I spend to get this process going? Um, so time is a big deal for me in my life. And so this presentation is going to be a lot about like how I view time through the lens of real estate investing and investing in general. I'm going to talk to you about how long it took me to get started, about which asset classes I started with first. Uh, you might be surprised there's one or two in there that you may not have heard of. And then uh, my 10-year plan. And I actually have numbers to show you because I'm an engineer at heart and I love spreadsheets. So uh, let's get going. So again, this is mostly about time. I um, Time both like how much time is this going to take to build my ultimate pot of wealth, get to my FI number, my financial independence, but also like how much time is this going to take me today? on this weekend, on this evening, to be able to spin up my investing in real estate. Because I knew from the little bit of knowledge I had about real estate investing that it could actually do better than investing in the stock market. That is the the data that I had to go on. So I'm like, okay, I want to invest in, in real estate too by the time. But but backtracking a little bit, it didn't start there. So this is how I spent my 20s. And I was a traveling whitewater kayaker. I paddled rivers all over the world. I taught for traveling high schools. I coached for traveling high schools. I was just like this seeker of ultimate adventures, right? And I waved this dirtbag flag uh, very proudly. I lived on very little. I lived very simply. And I think that that's all really, um, those are tools in my tool belt now. I don't need a lot of material goods to be really happy, but I also sort of ignored financial things. I didn't accrue debt. Luckily, I was a little bit scared of debt, but I also didn't accrue any wealth. I I basically like didn't think about it and didn't want to prioritize it because I maybe I thought somehow that it wasn't a valuable thing to prioritize. And I'm actually unpacking a lot of that in my own work these days. I, I try to go live on YouTube every Monday to talk a little bit about this like internal journey with money that I'm doing. So uh, stay tuned for that a little bit vulnerable there. But this is what I was doing in my 20s. Now, this led into meeting my husband. I met him on the Yangtze River. Um, he's not Chinese, but he was guiding there as well. And we moved into this RV for two years while we wrote this guidebook, Paddling America. Now, at this point, I had started to realize that I was getting panic attacks anytime unexpected bills came in. Our freelancer lifestyle was just not conducive to me having a quality of life that I needed with mental health. There was no financial security. I had just like hit a point where I was like, I have to change this. And unfortunately that sent me, oh, and on top of this, I'm pregnant with kiddo number one, right? Um, so adding a little bit more pressure to that, uh, to that cooker pot there. Um, so I go back to grad school. This is a traditional path that a lot of people do when they want more security, right? I became an engineer, very typical engineers, teachers, lawyers, all of those. Um, and I'm now 35 years old thinking that like, great, I've done it. Financial stability. Here I come. Like, reliable paychecks. This is going to be great. But I was 
pretty underpaid from the beginning, as we found out in later studies, in fact. And then I was also like barely able to keep my family afloat. And and to me, I was like, this is how it's going to be. And finally, I began to listen to these whispers of real estate investing. And I was like, I have to do this. I hit this breaking point, really, where I was like, if these people can do it, I can do it too. So with our first home purchase was a primary residence this year. And uh, it was a single family rental that I ran the numbers for, wouldn't have worked out as a long-term rental. But if I split it into a duplex, it would be a good cash flowing rental. So the zoning allowed for that. We split that daylight basement down there into a second apartment that we moved into. So we also used the house hacking strategy here and lived in half of the um, home. This was with my young two-year-old daughter. It was during COVID. This was a one-bedroom apartment. I mean, you make some sacrifices when you're house hacking that you think that maybe you could rinse and repeat this as I did. I was like, what? We're going to do this every two years. We're going to buy a new house, house hack it, and we'll just build up a portfolio that way. But it was kind of exhausting, as you, you probably discovered with house hacking. Um, and, and in my hometown, I mean, this strategy worked to turn this single family rental into a duplex, but it's pretty hard at where I live locally to find homes that are going to be cash flowing rentals eventually. So we found our second house. Luckily, we loved it. It's in our little dream town here um, outside of Portland, Oregon. And um, and so instead of house hacking this or turning it into a, a duplex or turning it into a rental, we decided to short term rent it out. So we put it up on Airbnb and we travel. Luckily, we can go stay with grandparents. They love to see my kids. And um, when we travel for more than three weeks at a time, we declutter the house. It's a very good purge. I recommend it and, uh, and rent it out on Airbnb. And it's a great secondary form of income. And it's just one of the creative ways that, you know, like if you understand different types of real estate investing and how it works, um, it can be a, a good leverage tool for anyone who has a home to be able to dole out more income streams based on it. So with that knowledge, I actually found some partners and we began to develop a short-term rental management business. And I thought, this is it, right? Like I'm going to build up a short-term rental portfolio. I'll get started building the business and the management systems, and then I'll start buying underlying real estate. Well, that worked out pretty well. I still have two cash flowing rentals there. I don't own the underlying real estate, unfortunately, but it's a great business. It's it's, it's generating good income. Um, but these same partners and I also began to investigate this other form of real estate investing that we ended up pivoting towards. And this is non-performing note investing. And this is the one where I doubt most of you have ever heard about this. Uh, it looks like that. You're a, a bunch of paperwork. You're essentially fixing and flipping the mortgages behind houses. So we're taking a non-performing mortgage, meaning a borrower's not paying. We're going to buy that from the bank at like pennies on the dollar. And we're going to work with that borrower to help them start making new payments. We're able to be creative refinancers that the banks can't really do. And ultimately, if we have to, we can foreclose and take over the house. But that wasn't our strategy. So I built this business while my two partners had their first child. Um, and I put in a lot of work and write, this was going to be my real estate investing strategy. This was going to be my big wealth building strategy, the way that I could quit my engineering job, build a business that was going to be really highly lucrative down the road, um, only to have my two business partners basically realize that they just didn't like it and they didn't want to do it anymore. So I had spent a year and a half building this business and getting all the systems up and running, getting deal flow, getting capital partners, finding all kinds of ways to to grow this. And I actually did that through Good Eggs Real Estate Accelerator program. Um, and and then it was it was basically like killed in the dust without my two partners because I was also feeling so burnt out at this point. I was waking up at 4 a.m. Uh, on weekdays. I'm working weekends. I'm going to events. I'm like also working nine to five as an engineer, right? Like we're all trying to figure this out as we continue on with our daily life, which can make it really challenging. Um, so, and then on top of that, I'm pregnant with kiddo number two. So I could, literally couldn't pick up their slack. I was about to have my second child and thinking like, did I just waste the last four years of my life? Um, the answer is no, which is fantastic, but it can feel that way in the time, in the moment. Um, there's a lot of moments in our wealth building journey where it feels like we may not be making any progress. And I think that if we all look back on things, we're like, oh, actually I've made quite a bit of progress since then. Or we can see these failures as really big gifts that pivoted me towards something that has actually worked out way better for my family and my wealth. So this is how I felt. I felt like I was going in a million directions at one time when really I wanted to be doing this. this 
this is kind of a graphic um, I pulled from Greg McCowan's work on essentialism. And it really is nice focus of like, I want to go far in one direction. I don't want to be scattered. I have other priorities that I'm focusing on in my life these days. So my stage of life, two young kids, like how am I going to keep investing in real estate? It's all about time for me at this stage. Like I've spent a lot of time. I felt like I wasted a lot of time. I missed a lot of time of my daughter, right? And so like, I'm thinking about time a lot in here. This is what my life looks like now. And this is where I want to be spending my time. I don't want to be calling people in the mornings. I don't want to be driving for deals on the weekends. Um, quite honestly, I don't even in this stage of my life want to be building up my own business because it takes a lot of work and you don't get paid right away. I mean, typically with these businesses, right, it takes years to get them to the point where they're big and successful. So I decided, okay, fine, I'll do some of this passive real estate investing in syndications. And at that this point, I was like, I'll just do this for now um, because I still didn't believe that passive versus active was going to actually do just as well for me in my wealth building journey. But I, and I started at like $10,000 a year. And now just this past year is my first year to be able to invest $50,000 a year. And I'm really, really, really proud of that. And that's part of my kind of strategy moving forward. It feels pretty doable for me and my family um, with two semi-working parents. We, we try to stay flexible because sick days happen all the time. Sick days and snow days, right? Um, and I can't believe that like these are some of my properties now. I mean, I'm a part owner of self-storage units, of hotels, of multifamily properties. But just to look at them all on one page, even right now, I mean, I made this presentation and even right now it like kind of chokes me up to think that like I can put my money to grow in these assets and I don't have to do any work now that I've learned all about them to begin with. So here's a couple lessons that I learned, like looking back on this process. The first is that, Start five years early. And I say this because I I need to give myself the runway of like, I'm not going to need anything here for five years or more. And that helps me not sort of evaluate things for what they're going to do for me this year, because I just can't predict that. I can't control that. And typically, like if I look back now on the last five years, I can see massive progress and I can see that these streams of income that I built up, those two Airbnbs that I kind of manage on the side, even the couple non-performing notes that we have in our portfolio are actually my rental, right? As a great cash flowing rental that I'm going to sell in a few years, you're going to see me spike up in my investments here in my chart in just a moment. So looking back on five years actually gives you a lot of perspective and then not expecting things for five years is going to develop or decrease that instant gratification need that our brains all crave. Um, when I'm just saying like, I'm doing this for long-term wealth and five years is not that long of a term. I'm still going to be able to leverage my investments in, in just as little as five years. So lesson number two is to keep my priorities in check. Now that I'm entering in this part two, perhaps, of my wealth building journey, I know that what I'm not willing to negotiate. I know that like, I want to go skiing with this little girl as she learns how to ski. I want to ski with my two-year-old boy when he's first on his skis next winter, when he's just like two and a half or three. I think he's going to be fine because he's kind of a charger. And, and there's things that I, you know, you can't get back. So I always need to say like, wait a minute, what are my top priorities right now? What is the most fulfilling thing in my life? to bring me happiness daily. And it's usually the people around me. It's usually spending time with people. It's going slow. It's taking the time to not be rushed, not wake up at 4 a.m. and sit in front of a computer for 15 hours. Okay, this one, expect the unexpected. I think money has this like secret force that we don't understand. And I'm st it's, this is the woo-woo part of like lessons learned. But I really do believe that like once you start tracking your money. And once you start investing and thinking about how, yes, I am building my wealth, it's like going to start coming from unexpected places. And the example I'll give here is that my father passed away, unfortunately, a couple years ago. And this is a, a gentleman that I had expected to be taking care of long-term in the future. I saw his amount of um, assets and saw them running out in like 10 years. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I am going to have to be paying for his assisted living bill soon. And that was in my, like a weight in my head too, of like, okay, in 10 years, I'm going to have this massive monthly bill to be able to take care of. Um, he passed away and I, you know, I would, it was, it was hard, but it also like he gifted me a little bit of his remaining assets. And it was just enough to like give us an emergency savings fund so that every dime that we got after that, I could just start investing. And it was like very unexpected little bit of wealth injection into this journey that 
I could have easily been like, wow, I'm going to go spend this on a great year off vacation, or I'm going to go do this. But it was, you know, so that's just one example of like something that you may not actually expect something that may come down the pipeline. I had no, no sense that that was going to, um, that was going to be part of my life. And the last one is to trust in the numbers. Um, I really like seeing where I'm headed. I like seeing the trajectory of what it is that I'm doing now. It really helps me like keep up with the daily consistent action that is required to build our wealth and the way that we all want to do to show up in this world. And also to like, we're building our wealth so we can have a great life. And I also want to have a great life now. So I need to know that like the wealth thing is happening and I don't have to obsess about it. I can like, okay, I'm doing it. I'm doing little bits that's going to take me to get to this kind of end scenario in 10 to 15 years. And um, I can kind of focus on what's going on right now. So trusting the numbers allows me to do that, kind of pay more attention to the daily. So here are my numbers, right? The yellow is the money that I'm injecting into pa into passive real estate investments. Um, and I'm basically just reinvesting everything for this time period in this scenario. Um, and then you see that big spike, that's when I'm going to sell my rental. And I've kind of like, you know, used a trend line with the potential growth based on Zillow numbers over the past five years and foresaw that I'm hoping to be able to invest $250,000 based on the sale of that asset. So, I mean, this is all right. We're just like projecting numbers um, based on on kind of past performance. This is based on a 1.8x equity multiple. I really hope to overshoot that. It's also a five-year hold period. That can be flexible too. But it, again, this isn't so that I know exactly when I will have all of my passive income at a certain amount. This is just to like give me the inspiration that like, holy cow, I'm going to have $100,000 that I can be pulling off in cash flow from my passive investments alone by the time I'm 49. I didn't get started until I was like 37, 38 in this game. I mean, that blows my mind that I'm going to have $100,000 of passive income. And that's just the cash flow coming off of it, right? And this is all just showing that the cash flow numbers, that roughly like 8% preferred return that I'm getting off of these investments. This is not showing the underlying equity growth or the proceeds or the reinvestment of the initial capital every time. So I've got a lot of flexibility here. In fact, uh, I'm also going to overlay the little bit of stock portfolio that I have. Um, and if I continue to contribute to my IRA, just my husband and I at the minimum IRA amounts, we don't have a 401k, we don't have other things um, over the course, it's going to kind of like juice up my returns after I'm 65, just by a little bit, right? Not nearly as exciting as the real estate returns, though, as I'm sure you'd all agree. Now, here's another idea and just one other kind of way that I like to play with the numbers to be like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. My kids are going to go to college one day. And I hear that that costs a lot of money and I do not want them going into debt. I do want to train them to save for it and be strategic and maybe we'll buy a rental that they can live in. Maybe they're going to get scholarships, right? But I'm like, okay, what if I had to spend $50,000 a year for eight years in a row? Um, and I did that in this scenario. And like, you tell me, does that look really different from like, this is the one before and this is the one after? Um, so, oh no, I'm sorry. This is the one before, and this is the one after I'm pulling an extra $50,000. Basically I'm not reinvesting an extra $50,000 that might be from the proceeds. It might be from capital, my original capital being returned to me. Um, there's lots of places that I can pull that. So in addition to that income, I'm also pulling $50,000 more and putting it towards college for these years. There's not a significant change in my lifestyle. I mean, that blows my mind. I think that I... We, we think about these cliffs that are coming up of like when my income disappears or when I have to pay for college or um, all kinds of other things that are going to happen, right? These kids are going to cost money, money this whole time period, as Jason talked about yesterday and his... Um, He's reaching the age where cars are needed by his kids. And whoa, that's a little bit of a shocker too, that that will come down the pipeline. But um, but it's fun to be able to play with this and and then have and like have the peace of mind that like, oh, I'm going to be able to weather that like and not just weather that like I'm still going to be able to live a really comfortable life for myself. Um, so that's what the numbers do for me. My final lesson here is to just get started. And even if you are um, 
well into the journey of building your wealth, but you've learned about something new. Maybe you're learning about passive real estate investing, or maybe you're learning about a new asset class like preferred equity. And it's something new that might solve one of your mini challenges. Like maybe you want more reliable passive monthly income because it would just like give you more peace of mind. Well, preferred equity can do that for you. And so take the time to get started with whatever comes next in your wealth building journey, because it's, it's again, like start five years earlier than when you need it. If you take small daily action these days, like early on in the process, you're going to find yourself make incredible progress um, a lot quicker than you did as at least that that's how I've found it to be. So um, that's my full presentation for you today. I hope it gives you a nice like little window into like how someone else is managing this all. Like how, how are we all doing this? It's, and, and like, Hopefully you found a point of connection there. I mean, maybe you don't have kids. Maybe you're almost at their retirement age, but there's points in here that I think we can all pull from. And I hope that that was just a little bit one uh, more connection. And if you'd ever like to tell your story, I would love to interview you. I can certainly make it anonymous um, and we can talk about your numbers, how you got to where you did. We also often interview people on our Life and Money podcast about how they got um, to where they have in, in passive real estate investing and their wealth building journey. And I really think that these personal one-on-one -on -one stories can help us all uh, break down some barriers. So I noticed that Jason joined us as well, um, and we haven't had any questions, so we might call it a day here and hope everyone was just a little bit more inspired on their Wednesday morning. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks for the next Good Egg Live.